Welcome to the Dr. Geo Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo, where we look to improving your prostate health and how to live better with age. Um, Mojita, thank you so much for being here. I, I, I know uh, we were just talking about um, you just arrived to rally to, uh, along with my boss, Herb Lepore, uh, working on some things with the uh, urological meeting uh, uh, of some sort. So anyway, thank you for doing this. Um, my you know, pleasure, we, Gio, and thank you so much for having me on this show. I really appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. Look, um, look, I, I, I think that it's almost like you know getting like the LeBron James of testosterone on. So I, I it's almost like I can't believe that this is actually happening. So you, uh, I, I'm, I am so pleased and 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 grateful. All right, testosterone, <laughs> boy. You know, if you if you look behind me, you'll find a familiar molecule I was noticing there. That. I wasn't, yes. You know, That's right. it's, it's, you know, for the last 10 years, I've just been fascinated with that molecule. And I, I've looked at several of your scientific papers. How many papers do you think you've written on the topic off the top of your head, by the way? Scientific papers. Uh, probably 80 or 90 papers. And that's what I think. Because every time yeah. when I yeah. med your name and testosterone, it was about a hundred or so papers. I was like, well, I can't read all of them. Um, yeah. You know, fascinating molecule. I think in part because I'm a man and I reached a middle age and then I reached beyond middle age. I was like, oh, I've been testing it. I see a lot of patients that I try to help with natural methods and other patients who have needed external and TRT. So, Let's start with this. Give me a little bit of your background, Mohit, if you don't mind, in terms of you went into urology and at some point you said, you know what? I like this andrology stuff. I'm going to go into testosterone treat. What was that about? How did, when did that happen and why? Yeah. So I was very fortunate because I trained at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And yep. one of my mentors was a gentleman by the name of Dr. Larry Lipschultz, who is world renowned in the field of men's health and infertility and sexual dysfunction. And I had the opportunity to do a fellowship with him. And uh, when I finished my fellowship, he asked me to join him. So this was in 2007. And uh, since then, it's just been an incredible ride. You know, my focus is- He's still working, different. isn't he? Still working. He's Dr. extremely Lynch, busy. Yeah. Absolutely. Extremely talented um, and just a, a great mentor. Um, but, you know, so uh, in 2007, I started a laboratory called the Ed Laboratory for Andrology Research, which is just research basically on testosterone and ED and sexual dysfunction. And I just kept going with it. And uh, for the past 16 years, um, you know, we've just really, most of our focus in research has been fascinating. Give us a little bit. So give us the audience. Like, why is testosterone even important? We, and we're going to stick. We know that women also uh, have testosterone. Let's stick to men. Why is it important in men? And, um, and, and let's start from there. What does, it, what, what does it do to us in terms of make us feel? Uh, what's that manly feeling? Because testosterone is associated with male and, and, and sure. male gender. What does it so, do to um, us? I'm going to focus on men, but I think we should also talk about women because I treat mm. a tremendous amount of women with you testosterone. Do. They benefit also. Yes, absolutely. And they do really well. But let's think about this. So testosterone has been around since 1935. That's mm -hmm. been a long time, 1935. And, uh, you know, over the years, uh, we've made better and better formulations. We have seven ways to treat men with testosterone. You can use an injection. You can use a patch, a pellet. There's a nasal spray. 2019, now we first got the, in the United States, the first oral testosterone that you can take twice a day. But most men prefer an injection. So what happens to them? So what some of the symptoms they can see in improvement? Energy. So many patients will say energy is important better. Fatigue, libido, uh, erections, muscle mass, decreased fat deposition, improvements in depression. We wrote a paper on that as well. Some patients report better sleep. We know that there's a physical benefit. We know that it can help with osteoporosis, osteopenia, uh, that's been used in many patients uh, for uh, anemia in the old days. That's how you should treat patients to give them testosterone and raise the hematocrit in those patients. 
But, um, you know, those are some of the benefits you'll see. Now, not every patient sees all of those benefits. And sometimes right. patients come to me and say, give me the testosterone and I want to fix all my problems. I said, that's not going to happen. It's going to help you. Uh, and if you combine the medication with lifestyle modification, and I call it the four pillars, it's diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction. You right. combine that with the hormones, it's very synergistic and patients tend to benefit more. What is it testosterone that attaches to these receptors or it's metabolites like the dihydrotestosterone, DHT, we know it's a, it's a stronger attachment to the receptors. What if there's too much DHT? What component of it, well, we'll talk about its relationship to the prostate in a second, but let's talk about its metabolites. It can, it does its own thing. It attaches to a receptor and does its own thing. You can expand on that. Also, its metabolites, as it can convert into estrogen. If there's a lot of aromatase activity. That's the enzyme Absolutely. that converts that testosterone to estrogen, then DHT. When you look at these labs, what are you looking for, particularly when you have somebody on TRT? If there's a lot of conversion, what do you do? Like, take us through that process with a male, let's just say 52-year-old male, no history of prostate cancer or anything, low T, you put them on, on treatment. What's that process like? Sure. So remember that the majority of testosterone metabolized by the kidneys. So the majority, mm -hmm. as a, that's important. And why is that important? Because as I treat these patients for longer and long periods of time, as they start to develop in some renal insufficiency, I have to come down on the dose. Best example is when I use testosterone pellets. I have some men I've been treating for over 10 years. And mm. uh, you start at one dose, and as their kidney function starts to decline, you have to come down on the dose of the testosterone. So that's important. But what you described was how we metabolize uh, urine in terms, in terms of testosterone in terms of other hormones. Six to eight percent of testosterone is um, uh, turned into DHT. So we will uh, convert six to eight percent of testosterone to DHT, which stands for dihydrotestosterone. Roughly 0.3 percent, very small, we convert into estradiol. Now, why is that important? Because if you get too much estradiol, for example, you're more likely to get gynecomastia breast tenderness. And I can say that it, I do think that some patients will get an adverse event um, in terms of sexual function and libido, because I do think that too much estrogen is bad. But I also think that too little estrogen is bad as well. I call it the inverted U, where the, mm -hmm. the, the body really likes to be in the middle when it comes to estrogen. Sure. So if someone has a very high level of testosterone and they're converting into estrogen, uh, then one option is to either decrease the testosterone, which men don't like to do, or use an aromatase inhibitor, which is a medication that blocks the conversion from testosterone to estradiol. The problem is that many clinicians will use uh, high levels of aromatase inhibitors, high doses, um, but they just, and, and what happens is a lot of these patients feel worse. Uh, you'll take their, say, estradiol from 60 down to 10, and uh, you'll think that's a good thing because men don't need estrogen, but they do need estrogen. It's actually very important. A wonderful study in the uh, New World Journal of Medicine showing that Many believe that the effects of testosterone are really estrogen derived, the positive effects. So don't shut them down all the way, manage right. it, you know, given that. And then for dihydrotestosterone, if you have too much testosterone, you can get more dihydrotestosterone. And the two main implications are male pattern balding, which is a hair loss. And the other one is BPH or enlargement of the prostate. Um, you know, it, there is a saturation effect. So having more DHT doesn't necessarily cause greater worsening uh, urinary symptoms. But there is some data to suggest that higher DHT may increase hair loss. So that's why finasteride is sold as, uh, you know, Proscar or Propecia. Now, when I you just want to say one more comment. Yeah, yeah, more, go ahead. I, sure. I'm really not a big fan of these medications, the, the finasteride medication. They yeah. Are, you know, we were taught in medical school that it just blocked the conversion from testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, but that's not true. It blocks numerous pathways, up to 12 pathways, including what we call neurosteroids. These neurosteroids, allopregnenolone, are responsible for anxiety, depression, um, and right. there are many countries now that have put suicidal ideations on the package insert. Uh, there have been patients, many patients have commit suicide in uh, yep. taking this medication. Uh, I had a trial myself, hair failure, 
two out of 25 patients have committed suicide. So that's serious, you know, and so post-finasteride syndrome is real. I think it's real. I think that there is much more than just T going to DHT. Right. There's much more. There's not just T going to DHT and everything else is fine. There are other pathways that are blocked. Patients for stacking yeah. depression, anxiety. Um, you see it. And sometimes as men get older, they say, um, I'm taking Proscar and I'm starting to get ED, low libido, decreased muscle mass. Oh, that's normal because I'm older. Maybe it's getting older. Maybe it's the finasteride. Right? Correct. And so, yeah. so I just think that, you know, I'm just not, I just really tell patients to be cautious and, you know, try to avoid taking that medication. That, that brings me to hear you say that brings me uh, some level of pleasure because it's not that. So the, I, mo most people think that I, I'm just sticking to a, a natural approach and that's it. And mostly I'm sticking to what I know best, which is a natural and lifestyle approach. But I also care for what works and I want, I don't want my patients to uh, be on things that probably can cause more harm than good. So there's been numerous times for a long time where I've said, look, I, I don't think finasteride is a good thing. And I've gotten them off or I've, I've asked them to talk to their urologist about it. And I've gotten some pushback and, mm -hmm. and so forth, including the potential risk of more advanced prostate cancer from the reduced trial and the uh, few other trials. So it brings me. So is there I, I, I haven't seen um, because a. Finasteride, I don't think it does such a great job in reducing urinary, uh, lower urinary tract symptoms. It, and that's the yeah, primary yeah. reason why a lot of my patients would take it. And then B, because of all, all the side effects that you've mentioned, is there ever right. a reason? I mean, hair loss, I mean, even in, I, I mean, is there ever, first of all, obviously you can, <laughs> maybe I have some bias <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, I, I had a patient today actually who is, he was, he actually is on, actually very interesting case, on TRT, just diagnosed with a low risk Gleason 6 volume mm. 10% and was put on finasteride because he converted quite a bit. And I, I said to him, I said, look, he, you know, for, for hair loss, I said, look, I could help you, you know, I can teach you how to shave your head in a very nice way that you, know, where you don't have to, you know, nick yourself much. Um, but I will get you off the finasteride. We're going to talk about active surveillance and some phases of prostate cancer in a little bit and whether or not TRT is the right thing if they are hypogonadal, which I, I think I know the answer, but I want to let you talk about that. But going back to our scenario, is there ever a point that you say you, you need finasteride? What yeah. ratio between total and DHT do you go by? And if you have any. And what ratio between total uh, testosterone and estradiol do you kind of gauge whether you need aromatase inhibitor or 5-alpha reductase inhibitor? The, it, the key point is that everyone is different, right? So yeah. you can't just use one number for everybody. Right. So for example, we have this number 300 nanogram per deciliter of testosterone. Right. And that means if you're below that number, the insurance company will cover you yeah. and you're qualified. So if you're 290, you're covered. But if you're 310, you're not. That doesn't make any sense. Right. It makes no sense at all. And so, so everyone's different. You and I have different levels where I would say we have a cut point, a set point where we feel better. And we did this study many years ago when I was a, just having my fellowship where we were looking at the blood of every man that came in and we looked at the sensitivity of the androgen receptors. You brought this up earlier. And we showed that those men who have more insensitive androgen receptors tend to need more testosterone to feel better which makes sense. And those men with very sensitive androgen receptors tend to need less. So this concept that everyone has to be at this ratio and have to have this cut off. That's it interesting. It makes sense. You know, you were all different so, and we all feel better at a different level. That's interesting. One of our colleagues, more of your colleague who we're trying to get on the podcast, Abe, Abraham Morgenthaler, has posted on Twitter things like, you know, exercise doesn't really do anything to testosterone. There is some truth to that because it really depends on the dosage and the prescription of the exercise. So if you're running marathons, that is ca catastrophic to testosterone production. If you're doing other things, it's helpful. But one, one research study shows, and it's a systemic review, that the an there's more androgen receptors after weightlifting. So 
there is no, well, actually there is some evidence, but we'll, we'll stick to that study. There's no evidence that weightlifting or weight resistant exercises increases testosterone. But what it does do, it increases the number of androgen receptors and the sensitivity of these androgen receptors, which then the outcome would be the same outcome that we all want. What, how, what do you, is there a, a, a clinical laboratory approach to measure androgen receptors? Because to me, I thought it was always tissue biopsy. Yeah, so you can measure androgen receptor sensitivity through a blood test. And what Interesting. You, you measure something called the CAG repeats. Yeah. Uh, and, and the longer the repeats, right. the greater the insensitivity. So in my lab, I have, my lab, it's difficult, but my technician says there, and he just counts them. He just counts them in circles on. And then he says, okay, Kira, we have uh, 25 CAG repeats or 20, 30 CAG, which is considered high, you know, or we have 19. So they, you can count the sensitive of the CAG repeats manually. And we do it internally for studies, but others have done this also. I mean, Dr. Zitzman is in Germany. He's done the largest series looking at androgen receptors and CAG repeats and sensitivity, showing the same thing that, you know, we're all different. And, and you know, tell us a little bit what CAG re repeats are. Yeah. So basically you're looking at amino acids within the androgen receptor and you're counting, and this is a specific sequence, uh, CAG repeats and you're counting. Yeah. Them. And if you have. Longer CAG repeats, more commonly seen, more sensitivity. And more uh, insensitivity. Insensitivity. So yeah. think about Gia, we're all, we're all very different. And so you, you, have to, you have to treat the patient clinically. So when I give a patient testosterone, and let's say their levels are 400 or 450, and that's the normal range. And they say, doctor, I still have um, low energy, low libido, erectile dysfunction, one or a way of position could be, well, you're in the normal range. Let's stop because you're in the normal range and let's go somewhere else. Think about Period. End of story. Stop end right story. there. You're normal. The range is 300 to 1,000. You're 450. We're done. Or the right. other option is to say, let me raise you a little bit higher into the normal range and we may see some benefit. And I would say that some patients can see benefit at higher levels within the normal range. Now, part of this also is you have to look at the free testosterone because the body only cares about the free. It doesn't really care about the total. Hold and, that hold that thought yeah. for a second, if you may, Mo, because uh, we're going to go there. Yeah, we're going to go into free testosterone. This measure, this ability to measure CHG repeats and uh, um, androgen receptor sensitivity is fascinating to me because I didn't know a that exists. I don't know if it's available to me. Maybe to specialized clinics like yours, and 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 I think there because um the way I have tried to determine if they have normal, let's just say, androgen receptor count, in normals in air quotes, and or sensitivity is by process of elimination. I, I, so is this type of lab, is a lab corp a quest? Or is no. it something that's specialized in clinics like yours? Yeah, it's, you know, it's not commercially, to my knowledge, it's not commercially available. Yeah. And so what you have to do is, and it's in my lab is a basic science lab, so it's not a commercial lab. Uh, yeah. We do experiments and studies. I'm not aware of commercial lab that looks at this. And I think it's used now in clinical trials. But, Gio, one other option is to take a person to a higher level in the normal range. And if they respond, you could assume uh, that maybe they had more sense of receptors. I mean, there's a way to do it simply just by just a litmus test, just to say, okay, I'm going to take you to our level within the normal range. Even the AUA guidelines, you know, they're recommended between the 450 and 600. So, you know, they, you can take them higher to a normal level and see if they respond. So I think that, um, as I said earlier, look at the patient. If they are not responding, maybe taking them to a higher level will have some benefit. Now, at some point, you could take them to a higher level and say, look, any higher than this, there's got to be something else going on. Maybe you're depressed. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's your thyroid. Maybe something else is going on. But... Um, definitely can't have one number for everybody where they must feel good. Can they, so this could be analogous to insulin resistance. So testosterone resistance, yeah. but all receptors have some degree of sensitivity, right? You know, all receptors, insulin right. receptors, androgen receptors, and none of us are a hundred percent, you know, like none of us. So think of it like we have variability on all these receptors right. in different degrees. So. 
So sometimes with being having more insensitive receptors, you may require more stimulus to right. get the response. Any idea what optimizes sensitivity, uh, androgen oh. receptor sensitivity, and even quality? Yeah. Or, is or it, number? There's a genetic component. Uh, receptors? Is it a genetic component? So yeah. There's a strong genetic component, which will dictate the CAG repeats. Um, so I think that's, that's probably one of the biggest. But, you know, there's things you can do to work around these symptoms. And I uh, still, we're going to go back to this over and over again. It's lifestyle modification, you know, and there are a lot of things when it comes to lifestyle modification that can raise your natural testosterone. So you are correct. that exercise may have a, at modest, I mean, I, I quote one study that showed 25 nanogram per deciliter increase in serum testosterone with exercise. 25 is not much. It was statistically correct. significant, but it wasn't clinically significant. Right. So 25. But what does work, which is profound, is weight loss. Yeah. Weight loss has such a profound impact on uh, improvements in testosterone. If you lose 10% of your body weight, just 10%, you'll see about 100 nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone. If you lose 15% of your body weight, it's almost a 300 nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone. So the best example is the bariatric surgery literature. When a patient mm -hmm. lose 15% of their body weight, you see a significant increase in their uh, serum testosterone. So that that data is around. And now it's bidirectional because if you gain 10% of your body weight, you'll lose 100 nanogram. If you gain 15%, you'll lose about 300. So it's a bidirectional relationship. But, you know, there's a there's a huge craze in the United States. And is that before yeah. more aromatase activity? Right, but there's other mechanisms too. It's not only aromatase and converting, the fat convert. So fat eat testosterone converts it in estrogen. That's aromatization. But there's other mechanisms. Leptin's being secreted as well. There's other mechanisms that are causing you to have um, a decrease in serum testosterone. But um, there is a craze in the United States, and you've seen this before, Geo, uh, these um, GLP-1 medications, Ozempic, Manjaro. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And yep. there's this large off-label use for weight loss, even yep. though they're FDA approved for diabetes, but there is a yep. large off-label use for weight loss. And these patients are losing, you know, a significant amount of weight, but the testosterone levels are going up uh, yep. as well. Now it's not the manjar, it's the weight loss, right? yep. but, um, but weight loss does. The sleep does also, remember we tend to make most of our testosterone when we sleep. If you're sleep deprived, there's a wonderful study. If you sleep deprived down to five hours, eight, less than, it was like less than eight hours for five nights in a row, that there was a 15% decline in serum testosterone. So the sleep is critical. The less sleep you have, the lower the T will be. And the study, there was a what, fascinating one that the second half of the night is more important than the first half. That's right. So if yeah. you get to sleep the last four hours, then you'll tend to maintain. But if you don't sleep those last four hours, that's where you really see a hit in your uh, serum testosterone. So yeah, you need to hit, you need to hit REM sleep, which is a second half of a second phase of the sleep cycle. There's a lot of wearables. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the aura ring, of course. Um, which is, yeah. So you, it's, 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 I think it's probably the best technology to measure sleep. Uh, the other technologies to measure other things and heart rate and all my patients have aura rings or their Apple, some wearable. And I get to measure it. So um, you can, and actually it's a fascinating, you can actually see their um, sleep cycle and those with, and of course there's multi, many variables involved, but those that don't get enough REM sleep typically have lower testosterone. That's what I've seen clinically. That makes sense. Free testosterone. Stress. Don't forget stress. Stress, you know, yeah. stress. Well, there's stress. It could be physical stress, emotional stress, yeah, I mean, it, it really takes a hit, and uh, that's uh, and that's due to the cortisol. Cortisol is a main mechanism, but right. it can be physical right. stress also. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of the ballerina effect. The ballerina effect is when a ballerina trains so hard physically that she'll stop menstruating or stop cycling. You know, you can have a huge impact. Um, the amount of physical stress you take on your body can inhibit uh, your hormone production. Absolutely. And very, very fascinating that we're having these lifestyle conversations because that's, that's certainly the area that I like to hang around in. Yeah. And then stress has an effect on sleep. So now you have a double whammy, right? And, and right. so that you never get to your REM sleep and so forth. And diet and exercise have an effect on sleep, right? And so right. if you want, you know, so they're all interrelated. All you know, interrelated. 
Yeah. Those are the four pillars in, in my mind as well, for sure. Free testosterone, Mo. I don't know if you've seen this. And, you know, I maybe you can speak on this. I think you were said earlier that I kind of paused you because I wanted to have a longer conversation on free testosterone. You were saying, look, all that matters is free. Okay. So I definitely agree with that. But this is what I've seen. And this is my assumption based on research. My assumption is that ultimately we need two to three percent free testosterone. So in a minute, you can correct me if I'm wrong with that assumption. Of course, it's based out of some research that I've seen. Number two, I've seen guys with 700 testosterone, but 1.5 free. And I've seen guys with like 320 with like 2.2 free. So in my mind, and, and they're asymptomatic. So the guys that have you know, 2 two percent free and above, they're asymptomatic. It's just an incidental finding and so forth. The guy that has 800, which, and, 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 you know, I think you know this very well. A lot of, a lot of docs don't know what to do with this information because they're saying, look, your, your testosterone is fine. It's 800, but they don't do the other workup. Then their freeze 1.5. They said, look, I low libido and so forth. So a two to 3%, is that what we want? And B, how often do you see this? I've even seen lower than 300, 280, but free is 2.2%. Is that, is that person, and assuming they're a asymptomatic, you know, okay. And, and we're talking from a health perspective too, because there's all these other health benefits and even cardiovascular benefits. Is this person okay? Yeah, so let's think about this. So, you know, how do we get free testosterone? So typically, uh, that sex hormone binding lava, which is SHBG, right. is made by the liver. And it's a very cle clever mechanism. Think about this. So our body starts making from the liver a lot of SHBG. This SHBG then binds to the testosterone and folds it. So we mm -hmm. don't see it. And then we have this free T floating around. When times of trouble, when this free T goes down, the body disassociates some of the SHBG. It's like storage and starts letting it go out free. And it keeps us really in balance. So this SHBG is really keeping us in balance, giving us the T or taking it away when we have too much or too little. Very nice system. The problem is that there are conditions that can increase the SHBG. There's conditions that can decrease the SHBG. These are medical conditions, such as hyperthyroid. So hyperthyroid can increase the SHBG. Hypothyroid can decrease the SHBG. And so, so, so essentially this um, body is only looking at how much free we have, but it's exactly what I said earlier. Everyone's different. You can't say that we all need 1%, 2%. Some people need less, some people need more. It's a clinically driven condition. So if someone is not seeing improvement in symptoms and they have an 800 per se, let's just say, but they have a very high elevated SHBG and the free T is low normal, well, there's your answer. That person typically needs higher levels of total T so that we can get the free T up because the SHBG stays constant. I have some pretty clever patients. They say, doc, don't give me any testosterone. Just lower my SHBG. And they know what they're talking about. Can you give me the pill that lowers my SHBG? And I say, I don't have a pill. Although androgens, if I give you testosterone, will lower your SHBG, which is nice. because so you're getting the T and it lowers your SHBG. Um, but again, that's kind of a constant number. So if you don't like your free T, the way to fix it is to raise your total T, which will then raise your free T, you know? So so do you want to, if there are mechanisms and there, there are some potential natural, so boron, for example, can lower SHBG. This is um, herbal roots called nettle root that seems to lower SHBG. Dietary factors can lower SHBG. So do we want, so is the approach, so let me make sure I got this correct. It's two point. Is 2% to 3% more or less what we're looking for ultimately? Is that the right? 2% is typically what we see in the textbooks. 2% right. free. You can have right. a plus or minus variation on that 2%, but about 2% free. Um, so, you know. And if that's so, so sometimes to get you to that level, if it's lower, is just increase the total. If you increase the total, you'll the increase total. the free. You have to. Right. By definition, because if you don't like your free T level, just increase the total. I do that. We use that in women quite a bit. Remember in women, 
if they have a history of um, uh, oral uh, contraceptive use, uh, birth control. What birth control does, it significantly, significantly increases SHPG levels. And there was a study many years ago by Erwin Goldstein that showed that some patients, if they take oral contraceptive pills longer than five years and they stop, they will still have permanently elevated SHPG levels, right? Suggesting that there could be some irreversible uh, sexual dysfunction for the fact that their free T will be very low. So how do I manage these women? I have to raise the total T significantly in order to get a higher free T. Um, so, so and when I said free T earlier was everything, I guess a better way to phrase it is that free T tends to be the best correlate with symptoms, right? It's the best correlate. It's more sensitive to a patient's symptoms than the total T. And how about as it relates to, look, uh, you know, my libido, this is actually a real case, you know, 278 total, 2.2% free, no real symptoms, libido fine, eat, you know, no erectile problems. But he's asking me, look, should I raise my total just for longevity and health reasons? Yeah. Muscularly, he's lean. He lifts weights. He's strong. No issues. He's just thinking, you know, heart disease, Alzheimer's, you know, yeah. should he raise his total while his percent free is 2.2? Yeah, I'm not a big believer in treating people who are not symptomatic. Yeah. Now, you know, if someone says, I have great energy, great libido, everything is perfect. My T is 278, you know, then I, I don't think that's really justified. Now, there are some exceptions, you know, people who have extremely low levels, 90, 80. I mean, there could be something pathological going on. Then you want to look at sure. bone mineral density for sure, you know, because those patients have a higher rate of having osteoporosis, osteopenia. And uh, osteopenia is a symptom, right? So that is an indication to treat someone with testosterone. So I just think, you know, and some patients, um, you know, this is kind of this debatable zone. We may get into this, but this insulin resistance, diabetes, yeah. low T inducing diabetes, um, is there a way to give T and can it help prevent diabetes? I think that's a little controversial. Clearly, we do know that if you take away T, you will induce a diabetic state. And how we have the best data on that is as urologists, we uh, give Lupron. And if that's you right. look at someone every three months, on Lupron. Every three months, a hemoglobin A1C just skyrockets. You know, yeah, so, so the listener, Lupron yeah. is a androgen deprivation therapy and p given to patients with advanced prostate cancer. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's well known. So I think that, you know, typically in the scenario you gave, a young man comes in or a relatively young man comes in, he says, I have no symptoms. I have great energy, great libido. Everything's working great. Muscular, because I measure body yeah. fat and I do a calculation and they have enough muscle too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Leave, leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's not yeah. symptomatic. You know? Right. Right. Unless you are, in, unless you belong to one of these, you know, anti-aging clinics, you never leave him alone. Everybody gets an injection. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. You're not leaving That's here true. without an injection at, That's true. at some of these cute clinics. I, it's weird what yeah. goes on out there sometimes. Yeah. All right. So the, the relationship with testosterone and or its metabolites and the prostate Let's yes. go with let's go with BPH, just an enlarged prostate. So mm -hmm. assumption, Geo's assumption, and again, everything is based on some experience or research. Right. You you give T, T, testosterone TRT to a patient, their PSA will go up almost inevitably, and their prostate will increase in size to some degree or another, almost inevitably, probably because of a lot of conversion to DHT. To so some just, degree, just, I agree with that, but not, <laughs> not completely. No way. Okay. The way it works is this, is that um, the, we were taught in medical school that the more testosterone you give, the greater the prostate growth and the greater the PSA. So more T, greater growth, greater PSA. That is not true. That is not true. There is a saturation point, and this is uh, one of Abe's uh, and sure. Abdul Trace's greatest inventions, uh, discoveries about the saturation model. So at some point, your prostate doesn't care how high you raise that T. It's not going up. It's not going to grow. It's not going to change the PSA. It's done, right? It's a shot. Is there an initial elevation in PSA? So today, TRT in three months, whatever, or six, two months, PSA goes up, but then it goes back down at some point. No, there's an initial elevation in patients who are below the saturation point. So I'll give you an example. We did a very nice study showing that this saturation point was roughly around 250. And most people will say, 
around 250 nanogram per deciliter is a saturation point. Everyone's different. So you may be yeah. 220, yeah, maybe 250, 260, but let's say it's 250 for you. If your level of starting testosterone is below 250, let's say it's 200, and I put you on testosterone, I expect that PSA to go up. And it, because it, it's basically a hypovolemic prostate trying to get to the uvolemic state. So that PSA will go up. And you may actually see a little bit of worsening of BPH because of or growth will be over growth as well. But it, then it's going to plateau and it's not going to go down. It's going to stay right. at that new number after right. three to six months and stay there. And so sometimes some clinicians get very nervous. I see the PSA rise, I stop. Sure. Stop. Then they see it come down, they start again, see it rise, it stops. Let it ride. We'll give it three to six months, set your new baseline. Now, if your starting testosterone is 295, you know, and you start T, I don't expect much of a PSA rise, right? And so where this gets really germane is when you have patients who have history of prostate cancer, radiation, you get, you give them a loop on, their testosterone is 50, and now they're coming to you because they want to start testosterone again, and you put them on it, and you see that PSA, it's going to just go way up because you started at 50 and you're way below. And now you got to explain to them, hey, I know you're getting nervous because it's rising, um, but this is what's expected. So as long as you let them know it's expected, we're going to find your new baseline. I think it's reasonable, but you know, that population is, it is controversial to treat those patients. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I think, yeah. I sincere, I, I think, so I don't, Abe, Abe Morgenthaler is not seeing patients <laughs> anymore. So you're the one man standing that you know, would give a, thinking, you know, he does a lot of virtual visits, but he's still so active in research and like in research, right. that's right. He, he really is. He's, 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 uh, he'll never stop. He's amazing. So, um, but yes, so, you know, we're still seeing these patients and they come in after radiation. Doc put me on it. I have a discussion with them. I said, look, I'll put you on it, but I just want you to realize your PSA will go up or we're just going to find the new baseline and, uh, and kind of go from there. Great. No, the way, uh, well, I've seen, I think what I've seen is uh, um, as exactly the, the scenarios that I've seen where, where they're under 250, PSA goes up. There's uh, uh, imaging evidence that their prostate grew, no symptoms of any kind. And so they're fine. Um, yeah. And then it, it does plateau. That's exactly the scenario where I've seen that I've seen. All right. So that's the ben that's the benign version. So then let's move on to prostate cancer. So here we are. This guy would uh, on, on he's 60 years old, active. Sir well, he just got diagnosed with Gleason six. The conversation is and he's been on TRT. The conversation is that there was no link between the two. But the, the so his doctors want to get him off of TRT. His his total is at eleven hundred, which is you know not not horrible. He feels great, and so the conversation is a. I mean, he, again, he newly diagnosed. He's trying to figure out treatment. So my conversation with him is: look, no treatment is good treatment right now because it's a low risk. You're on active surveillance, and put let's get you on a, the right uh, lifestyle protocol. And then is I'm saying I don't. I mean that you don't need to be off of t uh, TRT. So. Active surveillance in general, you know, they, um, what's that process like? Do you need another biopsy to make sure there's no undersampling in a year to make sure that, you know, he doesn't have a Gleason eight somewhere or seven somewhere before, and there are, and they are hypogonadal before you give him testosterone, or you can, a guy comes to you, act surveillance, he can get on TRT right away. What's your protocol? Let's look at the, this in the historical perspective. So 23 years ago, when I started my residency, there was not much active surveillance. Hey, any patient who had prostate cancer had treatment. I mean, that's what we did. And then as the years went on, we realized that the majority of prostate cancer is clinically insignificant, meaning that they will die from something else. Yeah. And so, uh, so that's why there's this huge movement of patients now on the surveillance. And they have low grade cancer, low volume cancer, and they're being followed. But this population is saying, I want my testosterone back, right? So now you're in this uh, situation where you have patients who have cancer that are asking for testosterone. And it can be quite challenging because um, this is very controversial. And so most would say that this should be considered being done in a clinical trial setting uh, because they say, what, you know, what, what can happen to these patients? We don't know. Now, I just want you to think of something. Gio, you treat patients, right? I treat a lot of patients with testosterone, okay? I see a lot. And if you look at the instance of occult prostate cancer in the community, it's one in six. 
one section manager just walking around with prostate cancer. Yeah, and they, they don't know you, it. They don't know it, and they'll yeah. die from something else. But did you know that there's never been a study to show that men being treated with testosterone have a higher incidence of prostate cancer than those men not being treated with testosterone? Not one. Never been proven that those men treated. So much so that in 2018, the AUA guidelines said that there's no association between testosterone and prostate cancer, and that's a strong recommendation. But Gio, it's not the fire know, to the cancer. It's not, it's it, not the gas. Yes, the, no, no, no relation. No, so that testosterone causes. Now, there was a second bullet in the t- 2018 AUA guidelines in testosterone saying that if a man has a history of prostate cancer, we don't know about the risk-benefit ratio of putting him on testosterone as of yet. Because we don't have enough st- studies, which is fair. We don't, right? So, but, but in general, the first bullet is testosterone does not increase the risk of prostate cancer. Now, of those men I told you, one in six men are walking with prostate cancer. And let's say I treat 60 men in my practice with testosterone. Gio, if I treat 60 men in my practice with testosterone, you know I'm giving 10 men with active prostate cancer testosterone. I'm giving it to them, but nothing's happening. They're not right. lighting up. We don't see that in the, in the trials that men with testosterone have higher incidence. So it's your kind of like your active surveillance testosterone group, essentially. And so, so... We don't see that. So we, A, myself, in 2011, believe we published a very small series of 13 patients on active surveillance, at least in three plus three, one patient at three plus four, no increased risk of prostate cancer, even after one year follow-up. So I think that, you know, many patients are getting testosterone on active surveillance, if you will, and it's not lighting they, up. They just don't know it. <laughs> don't know it. But um, I do think that, you know, this does need to be studied in a more formalized fashion. Because right now, all we have is re- small retrospective uh, studies. Very so, small retrospective can't, studies. so, all right. The problem here is that men are suffering from poor quality of life, likely unnecessarily, with low-risk prostate cancer. But because these studies are not available... How long can we, you know, you know, how long yeah. are we going to wait for these men to live, you know, poor quality of life? Probably to tell us at yeah. the end, I don't know, 20 years from now, whenever, uh, you know what? It's fine. You, you can treat men safely you yeah. know, that, before we have a, a high volume type of a, a randomized clinical trial. So what can a man do? What I've suggested to men is, look, I don't know who will treat you with, when you have prostate cancer or uh, low risk but I know it's, it's fine to have uh, and to be treated with TRT. You may have to sign numerous dotted lines and say, you know, you're not going to, because, you know, we do live in a litigious society. So you may have to sign the dotted line to make sure if things go the other way that you don't have. So what if a man is highly motivated? He says, look, I'm willing to do this. I need my quality of life. What should they do? Because the other thing is, how many Dr. Karas are, are, are out there? I don't see them. Yeah. I don't yeah, see them. Even Gio, just think about this. If if test, normal testosterone levels were so bad in men with active surveillance, then we should castrate all men on active surveillance. And we don't do that. Right. We leave those normal men who have normal testosterone normal. We leave those with low, low. But we can't decide which one's okay and which is not. But it, essentially, those men who have normal testosterone on active surveillance are left alone. You know? And so... But you nailed it. So everything comes down to this concept that we've been using for many years in neurology, which is shared decision-making, which means that if you explain the risks and the benefits to the patient, um, and I personally do not believe that it's causing harm to the patient. In fact, there's some data to suggest that normalizing testosterone may be protective. And so right now, let's say you had metastatic prostate cancer uh, and you went to John Hopkins, they would treat you with high doses of testosterone. Think about that. It's called bipolar engine therapy. Bath. They're bipolar. treating. So in, in a, a, in a metastatic research, uh, research scenario? Trial, but in numerous clinical trials they've published. This is by Dr. Den Mead's group. The first one came out in 2015. It's been eight years. Really interesting data. Taking men who have had metastatic prostate cancer, resistant to standard of care, and giving them high doses of testosterone. And what they find is if they see a reduction in the PSA, they see a reduction in the metastatic disease. That's interesting. There are other studies that have come out recently. Uh, uh, Tom Allen's group out of the University of Irvine showing that those men who received testosterone after prostate cancer surgery were less likely to have a recurrence 
of the prostate cancer than those men who had low testosterone levels. Hypogonadal men. Hypogonadal men. If yeah. you treat them, they're less likely. Stacey Loeb had a very nice uh, registry study out of she Sweden did. showing right. that, you know, if, yeah, your institution, that, you know, those, um, it was a registry study, but again, uh, those men that took testosterone levels were much like, had a higher testosterone level, much more likely to have, less likely to have aggressive prostate cancer. So, and, there and, is and, and again, data. just to be clear, hypogonadal is less than 300 by definition. That's the definition. Yes, that's the definition. So, that's interesting. So, so you're telling me if I've managed like prostate cancer, you're going to treat me with high doses of testosterone. Interesting, you know, and so, um, you know. And are they the treating 60s, in a bipolar BAT map? So bipolar androgen deprivation therapy, or is it just testosterone? So yeah, explain, I just want to make sure I have the Great whole, point. Yeah. Great point. What they do is they give an ant, Lupron anti-androgen, right? So levels are very low. Your testosterone is very low. And they give you high doses of testosterone, 400 milligrams IM of testosterone, and your testosterone will spike up. At the end of the four weeks, it's going to crash. And then you're already crashing because you're on loop on so you're low. So then you give them 400 again, and then you crash. So what we call it is BAT, bipolar androgen therapy, going up and going down. And essentially what some studies have shown, this is in the basic science literature, is that you can convert androgen uh, uh, insensitive prostate cancer, hormone resistant prostate cancer to hormone sensitive prostate cancer. When it's hormone sensitive and you switch it and then you drop the T levels, um, then the PSA will start to go down. That's an interesting concept. And it's a it's whole a fascinating science, concept. Whole science behind it. And uh, the articles and the studies are, are really very fascinating. And the patient, so is the treatment simultaneous? Is it same day or is it, how does it work? Uh, so Lupron, TRT, same day? Lupron on, then TRT, let's say a day or two after, essentially. Really? Uh, I don't know the exact time frame from Lupron to TRT, but the mm -hmm. patient remains on Lupron. So let's say you put them on a six month depot. They put them on a four month depo, but every month you're giving them these high doses of testosterone and then come down. So that's, uh, you know, think about that. I mean, that is not, so they had a very, very uh, big trial called the transformer trial. And the transformer trial great essentially name. looked, like yeah, the transformer great, trial. That's a great name. Yeah. Basically looking at patients who are getting enzalutamide, which is standard of care for patients who have uh, uh, hormone resistant prostate cancer. And so. Uh, um, and so they basically gave them enzalutamide or BAT, right? So yep. they flipped it. They said, I'll either give you the standard of care or I'll just give you high dose of testosterone, uh, showing that there's no difference in overall survival. And so, um, so I think times are How changing. How long were they looking at uh, these? Uh, uh, these were, the difference was about three to four months once they were hormone resistant. So it wasn't a significant amount of time. Um, I recall, I think it was three to four months, but I, I don't quote me on that. Is it an but ongoing think, study? It was, it was published. It was published in yeah. 2021. It was a very good study, transformer trial. And mm -hmm. this group, if you're going to follow a group, follow them. They're at a Hopkins, Dr. Denmi, very, very interesting in how they're looking at testosterone as a therapy to treat metastatic prostate cancer. That's fascinating. So again, yeah. um, I, they might be the only group. Is it, I mean, really, like I, <laughs> I've asked and I've been looking for yeah. and I've and, and again with Dr. Morgenthaler, you know, it doesn't seem like he's seen um, a whole lot of patients currently because he's doing a lot. Of, he's focusing on research, and then is then you. Every patient I have in Texas, I send them to you for testosterone, but then you can only see in state. So um, I, it's good to know that Johns Hopkins is on on you know on top of their game with TRT with advanced prostate cancer. That's that's amazing. Um, Great. So lastly, how long ago was the study that suggested or concluded that TRT increases the risk of cardiovascular disease? <laughs> well, so good topic. go ahead and debunk that one for, for us if you yeah. can and give well, us some clarity there. Yeah, I will tell you that. So I have to put this in the context of the story. So, you know, for many years up to 2010, newer studies showed that testosterone Low testosterone increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. That's been shown in many trials. And that giving testosterone may decrease risk factors for cardiovascular disease, such as diabetes and obesity. But it wasn't until 2010 when the SARIA study came out. And then there were three other studies, the ZOO study, the Sinkle study, and the Vigan study. They came out in a short period of time between 2010 to 2015, all suggesting there may be an increased risk of cardiovascular disease when you give men testosterone. 
Now, let me be very clear. Three of the four studies were retrospective, uh, no randomization. The Finkel study had no control group. These are database mining sort of studies. The Sari study was a randomized uh, placebo control trial, but the primary endpoint was not MACE. It was something else, but again, the primary endpoint was not MACE in that trial. So, so, but then after, so in 2015, the, the FDA said, look, we're going to make some changes to our label. We would like to also have a large trial to look at testosterone and cardiovascular disease. And the name of the trial is called the Traverse Trial. And the Traverse Trial, uh, 6,000 patients, five years, randomized placebo controlled trial, and the endpoint is MACE. Does testosterone cause a heart attack? The great news is the test Traverse Trial is complete, it's finished. Um, and you know, hopefully in 2023 this year, we'll see some results. And that really is going to be a very important landmark trial. What's but your guess? Also, What's your guess, Mo? It's really, you know, my, my, my guess based on prior literature is that testosterone does not increase cardiovascular disease, but it clearly, uh, we want to see what the results of the traverse trial. How about say. in men with a history of cardiovascular disease? Can, so a man with a history of cardio, maybe they had, you know, a couple of, you know, maybe they had a heart attack and they had a few, a few stents in. Uh, there are numerous meds yeah. can testosterone. So testosterone, let's not forget, t- testosterone can um, increase red blood cells, right? It can cause erythrocytosis uh, in certain patients. And you're right. right. If it gets a little high, there may be a theoretical cardiovascular risk. Remember, before last year, there was never a study to show that if you give testosterone and the hematocrit goes up, that you could get a heart attack. Last year was the first study that came out and that came out of the University of Miami, first study. It's a retrospective database study, and they showed it the first year, if you give testosterone, there might be a slight increase risk for cardiovascular events if your hematocrit goes up. But before then, it's never been shown. Mm. It was only shown in the polycythemia vera literature. So if someone has a malignancy, uh, uh, creating too many red blood cells, there is an increased cardiovascular risk, but it's never been shown in what we call secondary polycythemia, which is I'm at a high altitude, I'm taking testosterone. You know, in other words, people in Colorado who are at high altitude to so higher hematocrits, uh, they're not more prone to getting heart attacks, right? And so, so this Traverse trial is very important. What's nice about the Traverse trial also is that it's looking at prostate cancer. It's looking at uh, diabetes, it's a sure. fraction, it's a big trial. So in 2023, I just want everyone to be aware, uh, this is the study to look out for. Wow, I can't yeah. wait. So. Yeah. Just to be clear, even in cases where there's a history of cardiovascular disease, that doesn't mean they're not candidates for TRT. Well, let's think about the guidelines. So if someone has a heart attack, the AUA guideline says that you should wait three to six months before you start. Wow. Um, the endocrine guidelines say that after six months, you can start. They're not saying you can't indefinitely start. They said, you know, even after a heart attack, mm. you can restart. Both guidelines say that, but you want to just wait a period of time. Yeah, I don't, there's not a lot of science on where the periods of time came from, you mm-hmm. know, just, it's just that this is what they recommend. But in that fashion, I, I do believe, I personally believe that men with lower testosterone levels are much more likely to have a cardiovascular event. Now, is that causality or association? Because men with lower testosterone levels are more likely to have diabetes, yeah. obesity, metabolic syndrome. And is that giving that increased risk for a cardiovascular event, not the low T itself. Maybe an indirect effect, an association. But men with low testosterone levels, I do believe, are more likely to have a cardiovascular event. Well, we'll see for the, with the uh, Traverse. So that sometime in tw- this year, it will be published, right? I'm hoping. Publishers. I'm hoping, right. yes. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. What are the different methodologies to uh, for TRT? So there is topical, there is pellet, there is injections, and then we'll talk about the pills because that's, though not new, but this is probably the best form of pills that we've ever had because of how it's metabolized. Yes. Am I wrong to think that I've never liked topical for numerous reasons? One reason is because you can give it off to somebody else uh, unintentionally, right? But number two, Mo. What I've so there is a a great deal of five alpha reductase enzymes on the skin area. Yeah. So what I've seen, right? So these are patients that come in, 
that are on topical TRT, so they are, you know, they have a topical of any kind, androgel, whatever, they feel worse. So they don't trust their doctor. They see me. So what I see is their DHT is super high and their testosterone is, is, is really low. Explain that to, cause I think that's a fascinating phenomenon, uh, at least, you know, for the rest of us that, uh, or for a lot of people that don't do this kind of work. And am I wrong to think that, yeah, I'm not a big fan of topicals. Well, there's many reasons to not be a fan of topicals. So you nailed a couple. So transference. If someone has a pregnant wife or partner at home or child at home, even grandparents or young children, I don't like to give a topical because there's a, an increased risk for transference. But the other reason is because remember, you and I only get what gets penetrated in the skin. So if I give you uh, a million milligrams of testosterone and you get 0% penetrance, you get nothing, right? So it really is the, uh, a problem of skin penetration and everybody has a different degree of skin penetration. And there were numerous studies showing that if a man starts a topical today, the attrition rate is 80% at the end of one year. So 80% of the guys say, I can't do this for life. Right. Every morning, rub this on, wait till it dries. And then, you know, you get some variability and then I may not even get a good level. So the movement has really been towards injectables because they're easy, they're, um, they're cheap, but it is, you know, invasive. So some men can't do the injectables. Worlds is a very good alternative. Just the fact it has to be taken twice a day. So it's a little bit more than, you know, a little more time consuming, but twice a day, but they work very well. And now the United States, we have three orals. So, you know, the orals have been out for almost 50 years but it was never approved in the U.S. because, um, and they're called undecanoate. And those are the safe ones because they get metabolized by the lymphatic system. They don't go into the liver. The old testosterone actually went to the liver and it used to cause liver toxicity and damage, but the new ones don't. And in the U.S. now we have three that are FDA approved. And, Within uh, only the last couple of years, 2019, right? 2019, yes. So 2019, the first one got FDA approved, but they didn't go to market until 2020. And then last year, um, we had two approved and one is already to market uh, and one is still just FDA approved. And I, I suspect we're going to market pretty soon. So that's a pretty big deal. So there's three new orals in the US um, is a big deal. So, you know, I think orals are great. I think injectables are great. I think many patients do like pellets because they're convenient. They come in three times a year and they just get their pellet. And they Explain the pellets to our audience. What happens in that scenario? Yeah. So these came out in 2008. The, for, they were, they've been around for a while as compounded pellets. The mm -hmm. first ones that were FDA approved came out in 2008 uh, called Testapel. Mm -hmm. And essentially what a patient does, he comes in, lies on his side, and we make a numb up the area in the side of the buttocks or the side of the hip. And we make a three millimeter tiny incision and these pellets look like little grains of rice and you put them underneath the skin into the fat and you put a stereo step and that's it. And they go off and they release testosterone over four months, three to four months, and then they come back for their next insertion. So very convenient, particularly people who travel, no one have to hassle having an injection. It can be very convenient for them. And you know, every uh, four months, yeah. most health insurances pay for only, you know, up to, you know, for, uh, at about four, the fourth fourth mark period, fourth month period. But you see a serious drop on month three where they're like, hey, I need my, you you know, I need my pellets. You do. So it seems so, like they get a serious drop way before yeah. four months. Yeah. So we show, we published this. We showed that it's actually kind of slow, slow, slow decline. And then between month three and four, it's a nosedive, right? Yeah. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> and so, and so, but we, in the, in Texas though, uh, we have the ability to treat a lot of patients at three months, particularly Medicare patients. And that's really nice. It's a good service because these patients come in every three months and get it. And some men um, who feel that way may supplement with an injection or a gel the last month uh, to make right. it to the fourth month. We see that quite a bit as well. Going back to the pills, because it's fascinating that they're so available. I don't think people actually know that because it's so new. Side effects? Gastro, GI side effects, if any, yeah. does it cause an increase in um, hematocrit, like the injections? What, what's the side effect profile with these orals? So they're actually very favorable. So the uh, hematocrit erythrocytosis rate is less than 5%, which is actually really low. Because if you look at an injectable like an injection, it can be anywhere from 40 to 60%, depending on if it's an older patient, more likely to have erythrocytosis. So if someone has an elevation in their red blood cell count, you have a couple options. 
One is you can lower the dose, but most men don't want to lower the dose. Or you can switch them to a different formulation. For example, I used to switch them to a gel because the gel's rate of erythrocytosis 8 to 12%. I drop from 40 to 60%, I drop it to 8 to 12% on gel. But many men don't like the gel, but the other option now is to switch them to an oral because their erythrocytosis rate is even lower. Now, remember that so in 2015, uh, if you want to get a, a testosterone product through the FDA, uh, you will most likely need to do ambulatory or some kind of blood pressure monitoring or testing. So uh, uh, these uh, companies have done the testing uh, and the uh, hypertension rate can be anywhere from five to 7%. Uh, can see uh, start on the antihypertensive or increase the dose. And you see about a five millimeter of mercury increase in blood pressure. Not very significant, but it does increase. So I think that's one of the side effects. I don't think that's unique to the orals. I think they all increase blood pressure. Sure. They class effects, but sort of these medications had to do the testing because that's when the FDA started asking for the testing. Excellent. Um, wow. <laughs> I think that we'll see um, a, a lot more of those type of prescriptions uh, uh, for the orals as opposed to any other form. Yeah. All, you know, I think we're going to let you and I uh, go to sleep. <laughs> Um, yeah. Um, listen, Mo, thank you so much. My pleasure, um, Gio. Let, uh, let our audience know how they can reach you and the best method of getting to know your work. Well, um, a lot of it's on the website. And so it's, uh, Mo Kira, uh, Dr. Mo, Dr. Mo Dr. Kira dot com. Um, Dr. Mo Kira dot com. And we'll have yeah. that on our show notes. Yep. Yep. And that's where a lot of the research we're doing, a lot of just the articles we published, just a great place to kind of keep uh, all the resources. And then one of the best parts is you can go to patient resources and there's links to different societies like the Sexual Men's Society of North America, yeah. the ISSM, um, Ishwish. These are great resources. If you want to learn more about these topics, um, just click that link. Mo, well, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And again, I I, I remember when you came to do a grand rounds at NYU, I was like, whoa, that you blew uh, in our mind. Here we are. We're talking in the back with uh, some of our geology guys at NYU. And I said, I need to, got, I need to have you on the podcast. So, and I know how it could be challenging with your schedule and everything. So thank you so much. All the best to you. And I hope to thank see you. you. I, I really hope to see you in a couple of weeks in Dallas at the yeah. Society Absolutely. meeting. Thank you so much for having me on the show, Gio. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks, Mo. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Dr. Geo podcast. You can watch all episodes of this podcast and much more by subscribing to my YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash Geo Espinoza ND. If you love what you heard today, you can help by leaving a five star review of the podcast on Apple and Spotify as each review helps us reach more men who are serious about improving their urological health and how to function better with age. And for the latest research and actionable takeaways in the world of men's health and integrative urology, sign up for my newsletter at drgeo.com. I'll see you next time.